So you want to do some hunting with a bow and arrow. Hi, my name is Roy Canterbury. I'm going to be your host today on Arch Talk 101. And we have a guest with us that has, is doing just that. Landon, uh, welcome to the show. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about that yourself, something, introduce yourself and go from there. Um, my name is Landon Cox and I travel shooting archery. I have shot archery since I was 10 or 11, I think, and I'm 17 now. And I've traveled the world. I got to go to Italy shooting for Team USA and I stay traveling states shooting ASA circuit, USATs and anything I can. So, so what got you started in archery? Um, I started in the beginning with friends shooting NASP archery. And that's a really good youth program. And my coach in that, his son shot compound archery. And I always thought it was so cool that he shot compound. And I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> and I kept begging my dad to get me a bow. And I was like, I really think I want to do it. And then he got me one for Christmas. And from there, it's just kind of, led to here and been a never going dream yeah that nas program is is a really good program i yes. actually interviewed on one of the podcasts the president of NASP, and oh that's cool about the program and it, it, it's it's a great program gets kids started in there and i know when i was in school i don't remember if it's high school or um college one of the two i i had an archery class back in the 70s so oh, I don't really remember what part of the 70s uh uh, my brother just got a, a compound bow, you know, real fancy compound bow, the bear tail, white tail too, <laughs> you that's know, which cool. is an old, old, old one. Uh, I graduated yeah. from uh, recurves, you know, that's where I started. There was, I started before there was compound bows. They didn't exist when I started. So yeah, they, they've come oh, a long way now. <laughs> oh, it's, it's insane how like the bows then compared to now it's like, it's nuts. And every, it seems like every year now they're coming out with something new or some advancement in the bows, you know? Yeah. They got to keep advancing. You know, you stay there, somebody else is going to come out with new, new, bigger, better, fancier. And, and if you stay, yeah. you know, where you're at, you know, you're going to kind of get left behind because yeah, like, like, like new stuff. And, um, you know, I have, when I worked at Cat, um, Cabela's, I was able to get one of their reject bows to come back for some reason. You know, mm -hmm. there were strings and other things wrong with it. So I was able to get a really cheap price. Yeah, I forget what I paid for it, you know, 150 bucks, something like that. It was one of the $900 bear uh, brand bows. And yeah. other than that, my newest bow is like a 2003 that I use. I <laughs> still didn't set that one up, you know? Yeah. You know, I still go with the old stuff because it's it ain't it ain't broke. Don't fix it. You know, I don't, yeah, don't like, really need to look wrong with them, you know? Yeah. And... Uh, so do you use uh, mostly compounds or you do uh, recurves as well? Yeah, I pretty much only shoot compounds. I, I do have a bear bow, but I haven't got to spend much time with it, but I am wanting to hunt with it. I want to kill something with it. I think that would be neat. Yeah, it hunt. takes a lot of work with the traditional type bows because you got to get really good because there's no sights, no nothing on yeah, them. Yeah, and you, you got to get a lot closer to the animal, you know. Yeah, that, that's always uh, uh, a challenge when you, you know, just going from, you know, gun down to a bow, you know, you oh, yeah. lay down on your, on, on your ability to reach out there, you know, you're, you're, most of your deer are taken, you know, 10 to 20 yards. And, you know, I'll, I've taken one at 40 and everything else has been 20 or less. You know, I've taken probably more at 10 and 15 than I have any place else. Yeah. You know, and. Whitetail, but, it's, it's always going to be a much closer shot. Right. Yeah, but when you like, start getting the other ones, like 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 your your antelope in there. Yeah, yeah. I shot, tell, us uh, some, tell us a little something about those hunts. So the one that is up there in the corner, I shot him at fifty four, and so that's the closest I've been able to shoot one at. And then the one right behind me, I shot it at eighty two. And then I have one at the taxidermist right now that I shot at ninety five, all with a bow. Oh. Those those are some long shots. Yeah, I bet you do a lot of practicing at long range then do, too, don't yes, you? Yes, it's I, like going leading up to the hunt. It's I stay at about a hundred, just shooting and getting confident to where because I know that I'm gonna have to shoot one that far. Know there's a good chance of it out there. 
Yeah, you don't get real close on those. They have such no. good eyesight. You can't get close to them. It, it's insane how good their eyesight is. Like hunting those, we we went out there just like not wasn't guided, nothing. Didn't have a clue on, you know, how to hunt them. And we hit water holes the first couple of days. And then I, I killed the one up there the first year, spot and stalking, which was neat. And just to get to 54 on it was just insane luck to be able to get that close to it. Where, where did you hunt them at? Uh, Gillette, Wyoming. Wyoming? Yeah. They have a good population up there. Yeah. The, the population has kind of went down in the area I hunted up there, which sucks. But, I mean, it's still good. Like, I've killed all three years I went out there, which is really good. I mean spending money to go hunts like that it's like i need to you know i need to kill one right <laughs> yeah that's that that's one of those things that you know being 17 and i'm you know 50 plus years older than you are and i don't see yeah. those distances too well anymore so yeah taking yeah. those long shots it's like uh if i don't see them i can't shoot them <laughs> yeah like I've, i hunted with the first year i hunted with my dad and my sister and they both killed and then the second year I went out with Nick Metcalf and his family and then Curtis Broadneck, a pro elite shooter. And me and Curtis, you know, we were cool with shooting out to 100. And Nick was like, no, I think about 50 is as far as I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, you got to know your, what your limits are. You know, if you oh, know, yeah, 100, 100%. OK, I can consistently hit it at, at 50, then that's kind of my my limit. You know, you start pushing and then, you know, last thing you want to do is wound an animal that yeah that that, runs off and, and dies you know some days later yeah and the thing is especially like on those you know like you're restricted to the property you're hunting on and you know like if you do shoot one and it you wound it and it goes far enough to go on the neighbor's property like there's a chance you might not be able to even go on their property to get it you know yeah but uh the second year i was out there was probably we got out there and hunted opening day and we killed three goats on opening day and they were all pretty good bucks so that was that was crazy that yeah one was that that was pretty good when you can go in and you can get uh, um you know that kind of a success that's says a lot for you know yeah. your, your ability to track them down because they're they're definitely not an easy animal to hunt no uh nick and his wife were in a blind together and you know we were all in a group chat on our phones because like trying to keep updated like somebody shoots or whatever and nick texts and he's like candace just shot one and i'm like yeah i'm like that's good because this was like i don't know 9 a.m on opening morning and then like not 10 minutes later he texts again i just shot one <laughs> so they had two goats down out of the same blind within 10 or 15 minutes <laughs> that's a good spot yeah <laughs> and then your one is like where's mine i haven't seen any yet <laughs> yeah and then i killed that evening so it was that was a that's crazy always, day that's always nice when you can all get lucky and actually it's not really luck it's skill you know yeah you, you put it you put in the work to be able to be there find out what's going on and and practice and practice until you know you can hit the hit the animal you know in a good clean kill and when you um, get the opportunity you know you're ready yeah. to do it yeah, you know, I guess that's kind of what luck is, you know, being prepared for when the event comes that you, yeah. you're there. When you that's, actually that's get the opportunity, luck. you know. Yeah. When opportunity meets pre preparedness. <laughs> that's when success happens, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, last thing you want to do is get out there and, and they come in at 50 and, and then not make a good shot because you didn't practice those shots. Yeah, I mean, you're probably only going to get one opportunity, you know. Yeah. Got to make it count. Well, and you don't have that big a kill zone compared to like a whitetail and you're much closer. No, I didn't realize that until I got out there the first year. And it was really because my sister killed opening morning that year. And I got out of the blind to go. She was on different ends of the farm and I went to go clean it for her. And I went over there and I just, you know, you could just pick it up and throw it over my back. And it's wasn't no biggie, but, you know, throwing a whitetail over your back, that's, that's <laughs> pretty hard to do. Yeah, unless you're down in one of the states that have small body deer and yeah, then you can do them, you know. 
I know yeah, some of the many. states, you know, like Texas and Tennessee, that, you know, our fonts are as big as their adult theaters. And yeah, you know. here in Kentucky, it's kind of like they're decent size. You know, I'd say about normal on the deer. Yeah, Nebraska's got some good sized deer, and you just don't throw an adult sized doe or buck in in the back of the truck by yourself. No, you got to have some yeah. help. Yeah, you got to have some help of some kind, you know, whether it's a pulley or something, you know. Yeah. And I, I know I've seen those things attach into your, your trailer hitch, and then you can just hoist them up and turn them into mm -hmm. the back yeah, of the I, truck. And I've seen those. Yeah. Those are neat. Those would really save a man if he was by himself and killed killed one. Yeah, I, I prefer to hunt with somebody else, but still, it's it's a lot of work putting them in the back of the truck. Yeah, I spend white tail hunting. I'm normally hunting with the same guy most of the time. That's that's always nice to do when you get a hunting buddy that you can be hunting with. Yeah. So oh, it's yeah. Yeah. Tell us the story about the bobcat you got in the back. Those those kind of when I've seen those come in and and you're standing there and all of a sudden they're walking by you're not moving them up nothing and and they just stop and look up at you and you weren't yes. moving or nothing they just sensed you were there. So I kind of lucked out on that one because it was bo it was bobcat season. And, you know, I was in the stand with my bow because it was late deer season. And I didn't even know there was bobcats on the farm I was hunting. Like, I knew they were around, but I'd never seen one, you know. And I'm sitting there, and I catch something out of the corner of my eye. And at first, I was like, that's a house cat. Like, because I was hunting really close to my uncle's house. Right. I was like, oh, it must be a house cat or something. Like, at first glance, and it hit me, and I'm like, no, that's a bobcat. And it walked out and it got to where its back was to me so it couldn't see me. And it stopped at like 14 yards or something. Okay. And I was like, yeah, I was like, this is too perfect. And then I dropped it. Yeah, that, that, was, neat. That, that was that was good. They come in and had your back to you because, you know, they're real alert. Yeah, I was I hunted on Fred Pape's farm in October this year. And I seen four bobcats and which it wasn't season so i couldn't shoot one anyways but yeah. i wouldn't have had an opportunity to shoot any of those four so getting opportunities on those is hard especially with a bow yeah I, i've seen some come by when i was out hunting and, and you know but they were just you know the rifle range your way not not bow range and yeah you know they all, very mm -hmm. smart animals yeah, they're they're kind of tough. I know a, a, a hunting buddy of mine. He said he was in his tree and his bobcats come walking down the trail. The deer go, uh, probably following the scent of a deer, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden it just stops and looks right up at him, and he didn't move or nothing. It's just yeah. that just so alert. So when you can get a chance at a shot on one, you know that's might as well take it's it. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, take it. You know, yeah. if it's season, take it. You know? mm -hmm. Hundred percent. As long as long as you got the tag to shoot them, and yeah, and. You know, it depends on where you're at. Some you might need a fur bear spray. It. Some you might need other tags. I don't know. It depends on how each state's going to be a little different on what they do. Yeah, states are but different on it. Some states don't even have a hunting season on them, and then I don't know if Iowa did. Iowa used didn't used to have a, a hunting permit on them, but Nebraska did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, th things have it, changed. You know, it all yeah. it all depends. Mm hmm. Hundred percent. So, what's been your most challenging hunt you've had? Um, I would say antelope this past season. That was some hard hunting. It was conditions weren't good. It was cold. And for antelope, you want it to be hot. You want it hot so they have to come to the water. And the farm I was on this year just wasn't, wasn't very good for spot and stalking because it was just so flat. It was pretty much impossible. And I think I hunted. I killed on the third day. So the first day I spent, I didn't get out of the blind from sun up to sundown. Second day, same thing. And then, no, I killed the fourth day, actually. So I spent three days straight. You know, the only time I wasn't in a blind was when I was back in the room sleeping. And those are very long and boring days, especially when you're not seeing much. And after the third day, I was like, no, I was like, this isn't working. I was like, something has to change or 
you know, I'm just not going to kill a goat this year. Right. And I got out of the blind Thursday night and, or would have been Wednesday night, I think, and moved the blind I was in to a different water hole. And because I had watched goats go to that one from where I was at, I had watched them walk right through it and I knew they were there. So I was like, I'm going to make a move. And then the next morning at like 10 a.m., that buck stopped at 95 because he was he was chasing some does and the does came in, but the buck wasn't. And he was at 95 and I was like, yeah, I was like, this has been my first chance this week. I was like, I'm going to take this. And then we found it. That that does sound like a pretty challenging one. Just just sitting in a blind all day long and not seeing anything or Boring. seeing them off where you can't get to them. Yeah, you know, that's because that, I mean, on those you can see you can see forever out there, you know. So it's it sucks just watching them, you know, several <laughs> hundred yards away, just knowing they're not going to come over to you. <laughs> yeah, too far for bow. It'd, it'd be okay for a rifle shot, but not for a oh, bow yeah. shot. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And then there was there was one really big goat on that farm, and yeah, he was a Boone and Crockett goat. And I seen him the first day, the day before season, we seen him. And then the day after I killed, he showed back up on the farm. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> yeah, if you waited, but you never yeah. know. Yeah, he, he, oh, he wouldn't have came back if I'd have waited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that's just where they go. You know, it's like, okay, he, he you knew it was safe because you'd already got yours. And yeah, he was safe now, so he'd, he'd come back. It's amazing that kind of the instinct that some of these animals have. I know. Oh, um, yeah. Hunt buddy, I was telling me he was out in his tree stand and there's a trail coming down, trees blocking it. And then there's a spot where the shooting lane was and then more trees. And he watched his butt come down and stop right before that shooting lane and then run just that far to get through the shooting lane and start walking again. <laughs> that's it's that's about how I do. And it's like, how did. They, they know there's something they sense that stop danger run okay it's over yeah then then we're good you know yeah it, it's it's weird and i know all of us have kind of stories like that and yeah, i'm sure a, you have one what do you have a kind of story like that 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 happened where they did something weird like that yeah um so this would have been november november 3rd 2021 because i ended up killing a buck this day and we had hunted on the first, which was a Monday. And then we had, it was me and my hunting buddy and we had baseball on Tuesday. So we couldn't, you know, we couldn't go hunt because we had baseball practice. And we're like, or on Monday, we seen the buck. We seen a pretty good eight pointer on public land, but he just wouldn't work in for a shot. You know, he was just staying on the other side of the field. And we was like, okay, we'll get back at it. And he'll probably come in on Wednesday. Well, he was like, it was like clockwork at 4.30 every day. He was coming in, working a scrape. And then sometimes he was coming over like toward the stand. And sometimes he was just going to the other end. Well, he came, so be it. I looked at my phone and it was like 4.15. And I tapped my buddy and I was like, get ready. I was like, I know this deer's about to come in. And so be it, he comes in and I could see his, his G2s. I could see him sticking up over the hill because it was just perfect where he's working the rub like working the leaves up there licking branch and he did that and then I think that was like the fifth time I'd seen this deer and I still didn't get a shot and then that evening I had seven does came out into the field and this is like 30 minutes before shoot before shooting lights over on November 4th on a big cold front so it's like they're rutting I was like something has to happen you know Seven does in a field, yeah. like a buck is going to show up. Got to show up, so, right? <laughs> yeah. Something starts tearing up the woods, you know, and this eight pointer comes out and runs every single deer out of the field. Just starts trying to chase them and they all run out. And I'm like, well, shoot. And then he chases one off and then I hear something coming back. And this is 115 yards away on the other side of the field. And I pull my bottles up and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And it was about a 150 inch 10 pointer on public land in Kentucky, which for public, that's a giant. I mean, and, you know, so I got to watch him over there, work a scrape and chase a doe. 
and it was like neither of the bucks would come in. It was just if I'd had a rifle or if it was rifle season, either of them would have been dead. And then the eight pointer finally worked back through like 10 minutes of, into shooting light. And I got a shot on him finally, but it was, I think that was the sixth time he had came through that I finally got an opportunity, which was crazy. Yeah. We, we all have kind of stories like that, that, you know, they come in and do weird stuff like that. You just never know. Yeah. What, what's been your most um, rewarding hunt you've been on? I would say the buck that I just told you about killing that one because I would say most rewarding just because how hard it was to find that deer because I hit him a little far back, but the angle it was at, if it would have just went like, like this was the deer's body, if it would have just went straight through, I mean, he would have been dead in 150, 200 yards, I think. But when it hit, it must have hit something and it kicked straight down. So it didn't go, it went through him, but it didn't go straight through like the back side of his vitals. It like kicked toward the guts almost. And so we tracked it forever the next morning because we backed out after looking at blood and we was like, we just need to back out. It was cold. So the deer was fine and like the meat wouldn't run. And we backed out and if my buddy wouldn't have been with me, no way I could have found that deer. He's phenomenal at tracking deer and he saved my butt on that one big time because yeah. and then it it ran i mean down a mountain pretty much so dragging it back up was horrible <laughs> <laughs> I almost get a block and tackle go up and hook it and pull it up and then go to the next one and pull it up and mm -hmm. it's deer run down the worst things possible it always seems when you shoot one it's it's going to be hard to pull it back up <laughs> Yeah, they never run up the hills, always down the hills. It seems yeah, like. they always go down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this it, it, it's amazing, you know, what they do. And, and you know, we all have, you know, stories of things that went right and things that went wrong. And oh, and, yeah. And all that. So, yeah, it's it's the, the nice thing about it is, you know, is we're out there in the in the forest and we're camoed up and. And, you know, a lot of the critters don't even know what you are. They can't figure you out like a squirrel. If you're in yeah. full camo, they, they don't know who you are. They, they're they ain't not got afraid of you. No, yeah. I mean, they'll climb up the tree with you. <laughs> yeah. You know, or just stand or you can wave at them and everything. They'll just look at you like, huh? <laughs> yeah, they know something's there, but they don't know what it is. Yeah, they, they just can't figure it out. But, you know, as soon as you're in regular clothes, man, they're gone. Yeah. It's just something that's easy to feel you know, full of a squirrel's eyes. Um, and I remember one, one time I was sitting in a tree stand and, you know, not much going on. And this squirrel come out on this branch down below me as I don't shoot them up in the tree. It's just, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to send an arrow off to, I don't know where. And uh, so I, I didn't remember if it was squirrel season or not, because I had my regular hunting tag. So I open up my, my wallet, pull it out, pull out the card. It was Huh, squirrel season's open. Squirrels watch me the whole time. I put it back in there, put my wallet back in there. I draw back, squirrels watch all the time. It didn't even move in, until the arrow went through it. <laughs> <laughs> it just stood there the whole time. It didn't care yeah. that I was moving around. <laughs> yeah, well, won't move. That's kind yeah. of how uh like hogs are. I got a I went down and hunted hogs in Florida in 2021 in December or yeah, it would have been December. And those hogs were just like, they could smell very well, but their eyesight was so bad. Which was nice because, you know, with a whitetail, you can't really move. Like one's in front of you, you better not be moving. Right. With those hogs, it was like, you can move and do whatever and it doesn't matter. They, they just don't see that well. Yeah. I mean, opposite spectrum is an antelope. <laughs> yeah, the antelope, it's you move when they're, 150 yards away you're you're busted it, it's amazing how good their eyesight is and how bad the hog's eyesight is and yeah all the so weird how different all the animals are on that 
you know, then, then you have the turkeys and the deer and, and, you know, like, like your bobcats that you have there in the back, you know, yeah. each one takes a little different way to hunt, you know? Yeah. Different have you ever had a shot at it? Have you ever had a shot at a coyote? Coyote. No. Not yet. No. Not yet. I, almost, we, I almost did because it was rifle season and that morning, me and my buddy was hunting and we didn't take a rifle. And of course, Coyote runs through it because we're hunting on the edge of a field, you know, looking into the field, but it's kind of like sort of open in spots behind us in the woods. Coyote runs right through it, like 40 yards in the woods where there was no shot. And then that evening we took the rifle to, we was like, we'll bring a rifle just in case that Coyote steps back out, you know, we'll shoot it. And of course he didn't come through that evening. Yeah, they're they're. It, it's interesting. I had I was out turkey hunting one time, and you know with the bow, and I had the turkey decoys out, and then, uh, you know, it's getting about nine o'clock in the morning, and you know, I've been up for many hours, and uh, I'm kind of dozing off, and all of a sudden I hear something smack the the hard plastic decoy. Bam! I look, I'm looking. Here's a coyote. It went and attacked the turkey, and and run out a few feet, and it's like. Uh, I I miss shooting that that coyote. <laughs> yeah. like dozed off, and and here comes a coyote just attacking the plastic decoys because he thought he had a free meal. Yeah, I've heard stories of coyotes doing that, attacking decoys and stuff. Yeah, they they just you know they're looking for a free meal and uh, they they don't know the difference. No, they they think it is. They're going to try. Yeah, which is good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I for was too. To hunt a coyote. Yeah, <laughs> for us wanting to hunt, hunt, you know, shoot coyotes. And I, I know I was out during uh, rifle season, you know, here right too far from me. And and this coyote comes in, he's walking down the uh, the creek and he's just kind of standing there. And I had, you know, I had a perfect shot on him. It's like, yeah, I, I could have picked whatever part of him I wanted and hit it, you know, mm -hmm. with my rifle. But it's like okay, I'm not going to shoot a coyote, and maybe I'm going to scare out the probably the only deer that might come by. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, we didn't thing. have a big area to hunt, and I didn't want to clear out the area, so I I passed on it. You know, but yeah, you know, sometimes you're swallow shooting the don't shoot the coyote, and just in case, because if you shoot it, you know, you're going to scare everything off, or there's yeah. a chance that you do at least. You know, well, and as it turned out, I it, I wouldn't have scared anything off anyway. And there's there's a lot of coyotes in that part. Which is actually on the property next to us that I can't hunt. There's I hear coyotes there, you know, every time at night when I'm out at night, I can hear coyotes all over, you know, because I'm out in the middle of, of kind of nowhere in a village yeah. of about 168 people between Omaha and Nebraska. So uh, it's mostly farmland around here. <laughs> yeah. I know I have a friend from over there near Omaha, uh, Bill Lewis. Oh, yeah, I know Bill. I've yeah. known him for, for years. Yeah, I went to uh, Italy with Bill. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know Bill real real well. Yeah, he's a super good dude. We we uh, met each other in an archery club that was in back in the 90s. And in fact, my, my strap-on release, I bought from him. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it, still use it. It's my, it's my winter backup release. You know, I have a handheld, a Carter uh, Chocolate Addiction that I use. For everything i use it for hunting i use target everything because it'll it'll lock right onto the loop and just hang mm -hmm. off my bow yeah and, and i need you know on that i need my hand kind of pretty much open right at the seam because the trigger fits right in the seam between my index finger and my thumb mm -hmm. and if i don't if i don't have uh something on there then i you know if i have something on there i, I can't feel it so then i can't feel the trigger uh, but when it gets really cold i don't want to have basically my glove basically covers the back of my hand and a little bit on the palm, the fingers are all missing, the thumbs all missing, um, so there's not much there. But when it's really cold, I go to that strap on, and the, the release, the wrist re strap, and then I just need my index finger out. The other one could be kept warm. I can put my yeah. hand in my pocket. Yeah, I don't have and to grab that get, cold metal. <laughs> handheld, yeah, they get so cold during the winter. Oh yeah, yeah. You get know, up here in Nebraska, it's, it could easily be single digits when you're out there hunting i prefer not to go in that cold of weather and just because the older you get it harder it is to move when it gets cold <laughs> yeah i hate 
I hate hunting cold weather, but it seems like I end up doing it every year. Yeah. So it doesn't get horrible here in Kentucky, but I mean, there's still, there's a couple of days where, yeah, it'll be down closer to zero. Yeah, we, we have lots of days like that in our hunting season. Yeah. Uh, of course, our archery season starts in September. And um, here in March, the turkey, archery turkeys starts now, goes through May. And that shotgun, I think, starts in April sometime. I forgot to look. <laughs> yeah. But, I, 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 deer season opens in September and then closes in January, I think. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know when air turkey, bow turkey opens. I know shotgun will open in April. So tell us how, about your, your trip over to Italy. Yeah, so um, in May of 2022, uh, they hosted trials for the 3D World Championships and uh, made the team. It was me, Bill Lewis, and Jeremy Jarrett. And in September, we traveled over to Italy and I flew into Rome with my dad and we had a day in Rome. I think, yeah, I think we only had a day in Rome. So that was cool. You know, we got to go see the Coliseum and Treve Fountain, I think that's what it was called. You know, just a bunch of really cool old stuff over there. And then we traveled to Terni, Italy, where the tournament was. And everybody met up there that was there for Team USA. And that was a senior class. So pretty much there was a lot of professionals shooting it and grown men. So being 16, that was definitely something else going into that knowing that you know that's some of the best in the world and better be on my game to, to shoot against these guys and the first day just sucked I mean it was <laughs> it was rough but the second day I was able to shoot really good so I at least got some takeaway from it and then I was the highest compounder from America and I got to shoot in the team event with Two other guys. It was a longbow and a bear bow. And we shot the second highest score of the day, but got beat, which sucks. Yeah. You know, yeah. that went that would have won against any anybody else but Spain. So that's bad luck, I guess, on the drawing. Well, when you, you shoot against the best, it shows how what you gotta do to step up yeah. one, you know, one level higher. Yeah. So how it, how did you do in the individual? In uh, I think I was twenty third. Twenty third. Yeah, because I was twenty second makes head to head matches, so that that hurt being being the first man out of matches. But hopefully, I'll be able to go back next year and do better. Well, you know, being the first time there and at, and at your age competing against guys that have. A lot more experience. I'd say that's pretty good. Yeah, I was I was happy. I mean, I I did not have time to really practice for that because it's all judging yardages. And the two weeks before I left, I was in Wyoming hunting. And so I got back from Wyoming and I was home for like two or three days and I flew out. And then I was I got to judge a little bit like when I was home, but nowhere near enough. And I was like, hopefully when I get over there, you know, They'll have practice animals I can judge on because all the ASAs do and you know IBOs and always have practice animals. Of course, we get over there and they don't have any practice animals to judge <laughs> on. And we get out there and you know we were shooting crazy angles like up and down. It was having to, you know, having to judge a target, a target, and then say, okay, I got to cut five yards because it's that far downhill. You know, makes it hard. No, no range finders, huh? Yeah, no range finder. I don't like well, to have one, though. <laughs> then you, if you're going to have range finders, you must have marked yardage because that's what you're doing. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of people don't understand, you know, how to shoot angles. It's like, well, let's just cut this off and that off. And and I like to explain, you know, the, a lot of, uh, well, all you carpenters know the three, four, five triangle. You know, that's your right angle. So, mm -hmm. like, when you're shooting, 
let's say you're up on a in a tree stand on top of a hill and trails not the bottom of the hill you know or it could be tiller around but uh you have 20 yards going straight across it's 20 yards which you're actually 45 or 30 yards up you know mm -hmm. so there's there's your the 30 well 30 yards out 40 yards up and then you got 50 yards at the angle you know that's your triangle mm -hmm. and and a lot of people say yeah well what do you shoot it for because if you look straight line it looks like it's 50 but it's only 30 yards away and you know you're 40 yards up that's your three four five triangle and everyone says well I'll, I'll shoot it for 50 you just overshot it by 20 yards yeah you just missed the target yeah, that's the Forever. hard part is we, the the arrow only drops based on the horizontal distance it travels you know not not the the vertical distance that doesn't yeah. come into play and, and that's the hard part of figuring out you know how do you do that and what i used to do is i have a tree stand i'm gonna i'm gonna find a tree that's on the trail and i'm gonna go straight over to it judge the yardage of that tree and i know that's what's at I, I had one like that one time where it's like okay i know this is 20 yards to the to this tree which is on the trail but mm -hmm. i know that trail is 20 yards deer come by it looked like you know if i'd have shot it based on you know your your pins and gapping them and you know because i can mm -hmm. use those as kind of reference i'd have said it, it's probably 50 60 yards no it was only 20. i shot yeah. it for 20 got the deer you know because I, I i knew that effect in there that you have to judge on the horizontal distance not your angle yes. and that's where people say well just subtract five well it depends on how far it is away yeah, but judging uphill is is a little tough one because that you don't have that that reference to go in there, and you just have to kind of imagine where it's at. And yeah, we we had one uphill that he was with the cut and everything, like because we were supposed to have like it was forty five meters, so it would have been like forty eight and a half yards technically, some somewhere around there. And I hit an eleven on it, and Bill hit an eleven on it. And with our cut and everything, we decided that, that target would have been 60 yards. Like, like it was 60 yards, <laughs> which is insane. Because I walked up to it and I was like, that's that's forever away. I'm like, I know what 50 looks like. And that's a lot farther than that, you know. Yeah, you, ne you never know. And and I know I've shot with Bill several times and it's amazing after the shoot he can tell you how he shot every target i yeah. can't remember the target two time before yeah talking yeah, to know. bill after those rounds he was you know he could tell you what happened on about every single target i can't do that like at all like i can remember most of them i can remember the hard ones or you know but not not everything yeah Boy, I see me looking for a flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> I have the little pin lights that I carry in a little pouch. I carry two of them with me. And, you know, then I can always turn one on it. And if it, it dies, then I have another one with me. And and they're not real bright. They're just the little bitty mini mag lights. But, yeah. You know, now they have all the LED ones. When I started, they didn't have the big LED lights now, the, the halogen ones. And man, some of them are nice. Yeah. yeah. Now, now that now the new halogen ones are the new LED ones, this one's a rechargeable one that I just give her, and yeah, it's real bright. And yeah, nice thing about it, I can recharge it. I bought. I had one that was like, hey, I swear it was on my desk like not too long ago. I don't see it now, but it's like it's a little flashlight. It's only like you know this big. Man, is it bright! It it'll light up a whole trail like. It's insane. It's just LED, you know. Yeah, I've got one that uh Surefire 6P. It takes mm -hmm. the um uh the little three volt batteries, a couple yeah. of those. And you know, they're just a little they're they're fairly expensive, but you got about two hours with it before it goes dead if you're running on, on you know constantly. Yeah, and it is so bright. I, I had a guy had one of those D cell mag lights that takes the three batteries or four batteries or what it was. Shine it up in the trees, and I turned on mine, and it completely drowned it out. You couldn't tell his light was on. It's super bright, and it has a blue and a red filter that you can flip down over it. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's really bright, but um, the most time I don't need them. Actually, the, these light are for blood trail and these little small ones that have they're you know, nice little, for little lights. They they have a small focus, and as you're looking at blood trail at night, 
I don't want to see the whole great big thing because I got too much to look at. I want to look at a smaller spot. Yep. And, and I've been able to track better with the smaller one than I can with the great big old flood that drowns or, everything uh, out. For like walking into the stands in the morning or coming out at night, I've, uh, me and my buddy have switched to, you know, red or green LED lights because yeah. the deer, the deer can't see it, which is insane because, you know, he, I had a guy telling me this and I was, I was hunting Fred Pace farm, which is, I mean, it's an insane farm that, you know, super big, nice lodge full of, you know, has some 200 inch deer on the wall, a ton of African animals, you know, just anything and everything. So it's like, it's a dream house, you know? So just being there, I was, you know, stoked to be even just there. And it was, my dad had a meeting there for Kentucky S3DA. And so all the regional coordinators were there and everything. And uh, one of the regional coordinators that I know real well was like, take this light out. And he's like, cause my light was dead or something. He was like, take this. He was like, the deer can't see it, I promise. And I was coming out that night and I was like, you know what? I was like, I wanna see something. And, you know, there's, there was a deer like right below me. And so, you know, I popped a green light on and never even bats an eye at it, which was crazy, you know? Cause you know, if you shine a normal light, like even at a deer or something, it's, it knows, you know? Right. Those green lights, it's just like, they ain't got a clue on what's going on, which was nice. Cause you know, when you're getting out, you don't have to, there's something on, you know, you know, the other end of the field. You got a less chance of scaring them away, or making them blow, or you know whatever. Yeah, I know. There's there's times when I, in my tree stand, it's getting just just about dark, and it gets you know I don't like to get down right at the end of shooting time. You know I'll, <laughs> I'll get things ready, just kind of hang in there and just hang around just to make sure. And I had yeah. this one time, this deer come walking in, and it's right by my tree stand. You know, if it'd been a daylight, it'd been you know easy shot. But I can't get out of the tree stand because I don't want to scare it away. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're standing there. It's like, I didn't kind of move a little bit. And then all of a sudden something made a noise and then it, it kind of scurried off. But, you know, sometimes you're in there and, and you don't want to get down. And it'd be nice to be able to have a little light to shine. And um, I know the little, little, little bitty mini mags um, or the little pin lights on, they mm -hmm. have different colors and those you can get in red and green and different colors like that. And, those are nice because there's not a lot of massive light. Yeah. You know, sometimes you need to look in your backpack and and shining a white light in there is, you know, you're gonna it, you'll brighten see everything the whole force up. of light up. Yeah. yeah it, it, it's nice for that. Like, you know, once I'm in the stand in the mornings or, you know, having it, uh, you know, once you get up in the stand, I always have to, I always unzip my bag just where, you know, if I need anything, I don't have to unzip it during the hunt and, you know, get the bow out, my quiver up get the bow hung, you know, everything. It's nice to just have, not have to have everything super bright, you know. Yeah, it's it's always nice when you can get in and do that. I know I like to have my thing open so that, it, you know, my backpack open so I don't have to unzip them. I can just reach in and yeah. grab them. And the top of my backpack, I have the things that I'm going to need to grab, you know, yeah. like binoculars. And, um, you know, I haven't ever used the range finder when I've been out until this mm -hmm. last year. I I didn't didn't use it during arch season, but I used it during rifle season because I wanted to be far enough away. So where you need it. Where 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 they were coming out because where where we was hunting this year uh, for rifle season, they weren't showing up during the day. So archery just wasn't going to work because they never come through during the day. Mm -hmm. And where we're at, they come through uh, just before shooting time, and so you got to wait for them to get into the field. Well, I had to be far enough away that I could see them. So I used my range finder. It's like, okay, uh, this is 200 yards. Okay, for the rifle. Yeah. Easy shot, you know. At, at 200 yards, put where I want them dead on. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, now now I got a I got a little Vortex range finder. That I, yeah, I Vortex got makes here just a couple years ago. It was just, I, you know, I hunted for many, many years with no range finders, just learning how to judge yardage and, and, you know, it's, it, it, what I used to do sometimes is I had a, um, a 30 foot rope mm -hmm. with a little loop on it. And I, when I put my pegs in the tree, I'd loop that onto it, go out there and I'd put a little flag of some kind out there at 10 yards. And I'd take 
the rope from there and go out and here's 20 yards and then I can go I can mark the yardage in, in fields where That's I didn't smart, have any, you know. anything and now I know exactly how hard it is because my rope is 30 feet long mm -hmm. you know, so I know this is 10 yards That's and smart, I can yeah. just go out there and mark so now I have marks out in the, especially in open fields when you're not used to it yeah um you know that that helped a lot until I finally figured out you know how to judge yardage and and then I I learned um how I can you know I could just now I just step it off and I know okay that's 20 yards that's 30 yards because mm -hmm. you know when um I took an orientation class when I was in college and, and you don't count every step you count every other step so yeah. because otherwise just counting too much just count every other step and I know I walked off many times 11 and a half steps is 20 yards so I mm -hmm. step off 11 and a half steps that's 20 yards you know and then if I step off you know I, I can do increments less than that you know the math yeah. is a little bit more difficult trying to do shorter than that but you know between 10 and 20 yards I'm gonna put the pin in the same spot anyway oh yeah me too uh yeah yeah, yeah. on my hunting bow this year I could I could really do that because I it was a 75 pound bow so it was that arrow's moving out of there so you're gap's going to be a lot smaller and it's going to hit the same you know further distance yeah i i i generally hunt with 70 pounds and you know that i found the difference between 20 yards and 10 yards is about an inch yeah it's and, not and it, it's not enough to even worry about no. now the closer ones you know five yards and under yeah that's a big difference yeah at the I, at the asas they've been shoving like uh three to five yarders in and they can get some people because you know, when you're shooting a 50 yard course, you know, 50 yard max, and you're, you know, shooting range, you know, and then you got a three yarder and you're like, what do I do? Especially well, like the first time they did it. Yeah. I, I oh. had, um, I had a program. I don't, I don't know where it's at anymore, but I don't think it'll work on the new computers, but it would uh, print out a sight tape for you. Yeah. You, I know what you're talking you, about. Yeah. You would measure, you'd measure the the distance between your your knock and your peep, and the, and mm -hmm. you know the 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 peep to the side, and and the speed of the arrow, and all that. It would calculate everything for you. And yeah. I, I'd known that, and I looked at. I went to an event here in, in Nebraska, and they had a big platform with a gator, about mm -hmm. five feet away from the platform. So you had to bend way over. You know what I'm doing, and I'm bending over, bending over, bending over, and I knew on my bow. I need to shoot that at 70 yards. Yeah. And and then so I'm bending down, bending down, and so many people missed, and I got there where I was supposed to, and I finished my shot, nailed it right where it's supposed to. And it people don't this I feel people say, well, I'll just sight down the arrow. Have you ever sighted down the arrow? <laughs> no, that's what I'll do. And yeah. you know, what what do you shoot it for? You don't know. And and lots of times, you know, I've seen ranges where they'll uh, they'll put that up uh, just to get people like that you know just think yeah. about it especially like because the courses i shoot the the pros shoot on them too which i'm in k50 so the pros are shooting them and you know if you're in pro and you know, you're in the on the leaderboard and you miss that target or like don't 12 it when i say miss it you don't hit the 12 right. on that you're you're out points right there because you know 99 percent of the field is going to get that one and I think they do it just to try to get that 1% or that one person that's, you know, having a good day. <laughs> Turn her day a little little bit upside down. Yeah, well, exactly. exactly. And then when, when you think about it, when you draw back, the arrows at the corner of your mouth, generally, that's where you put it. You know, some of the yeah. traditionals will have it different places. But most of our uh, compound shooters, they're going to be at the corner of their mouth. They're going to be, you know, slightly below it or right there. Mm -hmm. But your eyes are up higher. So there is, you know, what, three, three and a half inches, yeah. four inches difference between where the arrow is and your eye is. But then where your arrow and your sight is, is up the same distance. So you're shooting, you know, probably three to four inches low, lower than where you're aiming. Yeah. Right, right, right out of the bow. And, you know, one way to kind of test that is, you know, put a target up, shoot it at, at five yards. Put your pin on that spot and see where the arrow hits and, and yeah, see so, where what, what you have to do to hit it where you, and you can figure out what you need to do and you know you got that trajectory you know going in it rises up same thing on a gun you know the barrel's actually tilted up slightly so that you shoot 
Uh, you know, you can sight those in going at, you know, like at 25 yards, depending on your load, you might be on at 100 or 200 yards, depending on yeah. where you're, where you're at. Um, I know I sighted in, in my rifle, I'm dead on at 200 yards. So I'm also dead on it at 26 yards. Yeah, which is nice to not have to move it. Right. Like at the, uh, you know, running open sites or roll-ups, whatever, whatever you want to call them. When word got out that there was a really short target, it was like everybody was taking their bows to, you know, say the elite booth because they have a, a target right there you can try their bows on. But everybody was getting, you know, their three and four yard marks on that or I'm going to Matthews or all the booths just trying to scramble to get something. And I was one of the guys that didn't do that and got out on the range and just hoped I wasn't up first on it because whoever shoots at first, I'm like, what'd you put it on? And then just kind of, I don't know, I have a decent idea now. Down there in Foley, I didn't because I switched I switched to Dart and Archery. I right. switched to their bows. And so I didn't know on the side marks because it's a different speed than my point was last year. And so I was like, I was like, I could miss this just because I don't exactly know where to put it on. But I put it, I think I put it on, it was four yards. And what was it? I want to say like 39, I think, yards on my sight tape hit. So it's just, you know, the bow, the speed, and everything plays into that so much. Yeah, a lot, a lot goes into that. And uh, you, you just, you know, that's kind of the fun is figuring out, you know, what do I got to do in these different situations? You know, trying to troubleshoot. And, yeah. Uh, you hate to do it when you're at the competition and it's like something comes yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. And, and knowing that, you know, we should all know how to do that because I've had shots where uh, the deer was basically walking underneath my tree stand, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's like, okay, I, I, I can't shoot straight down because I got straight on the spine. I can get some kind of angle. So you got to figure out, okay, am I going to get a shot? Cause they're underneath me. And yeah, I, uh, I switched to hunting in a saddle this year. And that's kind of nice because like, you know, you can, you can move all the way. I mean, pretty much all the way around the tree trying to, you know, if you need to get a different angle on something. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people starting to go to the saddle. I've, I've never, used one i've never really seen one up close um, yeah i i ordered one and got it and i was like well well i had one one for a while and i just had never never got around to committing to it and i got one and like the first hunt sucked because i didn't <laughs> know how to have everything adjusted like to be comfortable and stuff and you know now i know how to sit in it where it's more comfortable you know i on the back of the saddle like it's on the back of it it's more comfortable if you put it like lower on you instead because if that's up on your back it's gonna hurt like it but it wasn't comfortable on my back if it was up so i would just put it farther down and it was just a lot more comfortable yeah something you need to get and hang up in a tree at your house that just kind of figure out how to yeah, i gotta how to do it i got a telephone pole in the front yard so that was oh <laughs> i made sure to use it there first <laughs> yeah that that's always the thing you got to try try equipment out last thing you want to do is figure out what's going on as you're trying to set it up to go hunt yeah yeah definitely so what's uh what's your most uh challenging as far as target that you've had what your biggest challenge in target archery like tournament wise yeah I would say the 3D World Championships in Italy. That's that's the hardest ranges I've ever shot on by far. 100%. Those ranges was anything and everything. It was uphill, downhill, anything from three or four yards to 50, you know. So those were those were the hardest courses there. Then in like actual target archery, I would I would say Decatur, Alabama. That was 50 meters. And I started shooting a lot of 50 meters. And that tournament was just hard for me. Nerves were really high. You know, everybody's there. 
so tensions are high and I came out that day and I went 60, 60, 58. So, you know, I was leading the pack by a, uh, by a good couple points, like really early on. And so, you know, nerves just built the whole day and then matches. So we had two days of qual qualification, 72 arrows each. And I was fourth after the first day. And then I think I finished seventh because I had a misfire, which sucks. I was drawing back and I got to like right here. Like, you know, like I hit my back wall here and my release went off. Oh. And so it, it was just like, then I came back in matches and ended fourth. I just kind of got out of my groove in the semifinals. And then after that, it was hard to come back to really give it everything for the bronze medal match. Yeah, when, when you get a zero on an arrow because it, it went off early on you, that that kind of hard to come back from when Airbus is yeah. hitting something. You know. Yeah, which thankfully matches were the next day, so you know I had the had the evening to kind of get my mentality for matches that you know everybody's at zero today, you know everybody out there is beatable, and that's the fun. I really enjoy shooting matches, and especially with you know on the ASA circuit, I'm shooting with a you know grown men. I'm I think I'm the youngest. I'm one of the youngest in game. I'll say that. I'm not sure if I am or not. But, you know, when I go to USATS, it's 18 and under in my class. And so it's fun being around guys my age. And, you know, I have some really good friendships in those with other guys that compete. Like uh, in SoCal last year, it was me and Tyler Thomas in the gold medal match. And that's one of my really good friends. So being able to being on a stage like the gold medal match with, you know, one of your really good friends is just really, really fun to just get to shoot your bow and enjoy it. Yeah, that that's good because, you know, first or second, you know, either you or your, your, your good friend, one of you is going to win. Yeah, that, that was it. We're like before the match, like, cause on qualification day, we qualified, he was first and I was second. And one of our other friends was third. Jacob Merkel was third. And after qualifications, me and Tyler were talking. We was like, you know, we got to make the gold medal match together. Like, we, that would just be so cool to make it. Like, us both make it. Because we knew we were on different sides of the bracket shooting into it. And just the whole day, it was just like trying to get there, trying to get there. And then we both made it. And it was like, neither of us really cared at that point. Because, you know, whoever, whoever won, won. And whoever lost, you know, still is on the podium. So, that was fun. That was some of the most fun I've had at a tournament, I would say. Yeah, I kind of take the pressure off because, you know, you're on a podium, you're the first or second, you're on a podium with, with your, your good yeah. friend. So he ended up winning it, but like, I, I didn't really care. You know, I was happy to see him win either way. Yeah, I, I know that's, that's kind of the fun times. I, I know when, when I was doing a show with, with a buddy of mine, we'd go out and yeah, we didn't care. We could come in last, the next, the last. We didn't care mm -hmm. where we come in because it's it's who got to give the crap on the way home and who got to take it. You know, next yep, week it might change. Yeah, you, you know. <laughs> yep. Me and me and my buddies do that like in, in anything. It's always competitive. You know, it doesn't matter what we're doing, it's it's gonna be competitive, you know. Which I th I do think that helps a lot, like shooting competitions and stuff, because it's that. You know, no matter what, I, I don't want to lose today, you know. That, that always pushes you more, I would say. Yeah, I just, you know, the hardest part is, is when you make a bad shot, you keep thinking about that bad shot, and then you make another bad you shot. You keep thinking of the two bad shots. You make another one, you, make thing, you know, you, you're all done. If you shoot that bad shot, it's like, uh, okay, whatever. Uh, I don't care. Uh, it's done. Can't do anything about it. And just think of the concentrate on the next one making a, a perfect shot go through all the go through your process or your technique and and you know follow the process and go through it and shoot again <laughs> yeah that's that's a very hard thing especially like in vegas you know in vegas you're shooting three 300 rounds and you know you have to you literally have to be perfect pretty much i think i think eight eight ninety nine won my class so dropping one point and, you know, if you're shooting pro, if you, like, you have to shoot a 900 or you're just not even in it. And after I dropped my first one in Vegas, I was like, 
yeah, I was like, this week, this weekend is over because it was day one and I missed. Like, I shot a nine and I was like, oh, I was like, <laughs> the rest of the weekend, I just kind of just had a good time with friends more than more than shooting, which was yeah. I learned know what to do next year, you know. Yeah, yeah. Don't let that that one get it to you. I know when I was in high school in the rifle team, you know, you know, in prone, you know, but you shoot a hundred is is your best score you can get, and there at the 22 our nine ring is the diver the 22 you know yeah. and you take a hand of a straight pin and that hand will cover the 10 ring so if you're off by more than half the diameter of the 22 you got a nine and you're going along yeah. and you're getting tans you're getting tans and then you you throw it off just a little bit and you know now you drop the point now that one's your perfect 100 and yeah you, you know that perfect 100 eluded me the whole three years in high school i was able to get you know, 98s, 99s, but I'd always have one that would throw off, you know? Yeah, always that one. It's like 50 meters, like shooting, because you're at, you know, you're at 54 and a half. I think it's 54.6 yards is like what it equals to. You know, you want a 60, you know, every single end. And like, I shot senior nationals last year and I shot, shot good. I think I shot a six. It's like a 690 and a 691 or something. But, you know, shooting in the cadet division, which is under 18, you know, 690 normally is leading. Like, that, that'll get first, you know. And in there, I was in, like, 22nd because, you know, you're shooting with, you know, Braden Gillantine and Chris Schaff and just real wild and, like, all the big-time pros are there. So, you know, it takes a lot more. And I shot good, like, the entire weekend, but I didn't have a single 60. It was just, like, 59, 59, 59. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh. like both days I started off like with hitting the first five tens and I'm like okay and I'm like you know just one hit this one and we'll start the day off with a 60 it was a nine both days <laughs> <laughs> so it's like oh come on okay you started thinking about oh I need to, I need to hit a, a a 10 instead of focusing on on where you wanted arrow go the center of the x-ray yeah. and and yeah, you, you think about a it. bigger target and yeah, the, yeah, you think about it, you know, the, oh, this is for a 60 or uh, it's, it's over. Yeah, it's, and I found that, you know, true in, in a lot of things. And if you think about what you got to do, now you're not thinking about your process. And when you go yeah. through the process, you don't think about what you got to do. You just go through the process and, and just trust it, go through it every time and, and don't think. And um, I know on one of the podcasts, I had a hypnotist come in, an archery coach and hypnotist. And he mm -hmm. would go through and help people through problems like that. And um, yeah, you know, there, there's all kinds of things you can do and uh, different techniques that you can learn to kind of get away from that. And, you know, yeah. that, that's kind of the fun of coaching. You know, I become an archery coach in 95 when uh, NFA come through and had a, a training class and I went through and did all that. And, and that's the first time I learned how to do back tension release. And until then I'd heard, how do you know when you what you're going to do if you're not pulling the trigger you know i just didn't understand yeah. it until i learned it. it's like yeah. oh, oh, I know what saying, oh yeah. okay now i understand and and you know when i i was in archery first and then i went in martial arts and you know there we have a lot of you know you know efficiency of motion and stuff you know like mm -hmm. if you're going to break a board you got to be completely through it and, and i kind of adapt that into the archery coaching and then you know over the many years of teaching people i've just kind of you know, come up with my little variations on it that that really helps mm -hmm. me. And I teach it that way and then I have to modify it because everybody's going to shoot differently. Everybody's different. Everybody gets, you know, coached different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we talked I, uh, about that. Yes, uh, the, the last co uh, call, if you go back on a previous podcast, you know, we talked about that with the guy that was uh, um, uh, archery coach for college level. And, yeah, I, I know Mark. Yeah, Mark Elam. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he's he, he's not too too not too far from me. I think he's like, I think Lindsey Wilson's like two hours from here. I think. Yeah, so you, so you know him. Yeah, it, it's yeah. it's amazing and, the the different levels between you know the junior high and high school and then college level you know instruction and and what they do and variations on it and you know we got into quite a bit. You know, everybody's interested in that. Go back and listen to the the previous podcast. To, uh, we went through yeah. a lot of a lot of cool stuff that 
Yeah, it, it's just all amazing, you know, what you can learn and how everybody's different. And, you know, we talked about the fact that, you know, that's the fun part of coaching is, you know, working through the problems. You have a problem. Let's work through it. And, oh, yeah. You know, that's the nice thing now is we have a lot of resources available. And oh, there's so many. And that, that changes the game completely on, you know, having access to that stuff and being able to. You know, I'll just hop on YouTube and, you know, find a lot of different things, you know. Yeah. Which is some nice. things right, some things wrong. Uh, some things wrong, yes. Yes, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. <laughs> There's a few people yeah. that I, I'll, I'll watch and listen to. And, um, you know, that's why, you know, when I started the podcast, I also started Arch Shock 101 Facebook group. And, and mm-hmm. there, you know, if you want to upload a video of your shooting, you know, we'll take a look at it. And nice thing about that yeah. is when I first started, if you want to watch it, you're going to record it on a VCR tape. Yeah. Your phones didn't record videos at that time. And yeah. There was you know, no this in the 90s, you know. you know. And so I'm starting off, I'm coaching, and I'm I'm having to watch you, and you're going to have to shoot and shoot and shoot until I can pick mm-hmm. up what you're doing different or what you, I can help you correct on. And now I just do yeah. a video, and I was like, I can re- rewind it and watch it. And it's just so much easier. And, um, you know, in that group, you know, those that want to join that group, you know, it's it's all about archery. You know, if you want to, uh, you know, Arch Talk 101 is because beginners, you know, that we kind of cater to yeah. the beginner and, and asking questions. And, you know, if you have a question about something you're doing, you know, say like, you know, they have a question about, you know, competing at the level you're competing at, you know, post a question and then you can answer it, you know, or if you have a problem with the, the form, it's like, hey, I having this trouble. It's like here's here's my form with shooting. What ideas you have? And you know, I've successfully and you're gonna coached get help people. On. Yeah, I've successfully coached people uh, that don't even live in this country. You know, just by them posting videos, you know, is is yeah. on um that messenger. They'd post the video and I'd look at it and critique it, go on and on and on. And and you know, he's in the group, you know, so he he maybe listen to this, who knows, but you know, it was, it was really yeah. interesting, you know, to uh, well, coach somebody cool. that yeah. way. Yeah. Having, having somebody that you can get to look at your shot and help you on things is very important. Like I've noticed big differences in my shooting. Like the guy that helps me is no, nah, he's about like an hour from here. And, you know, he's Eric Griggs. He owns gas bow strings. If you've, heard of him and you know I'm pretty close to Eric and you know it sits up on my bows and stuff and it's like if I'm struggling I'm like Eric you know I need help you know will you watch me for a little bit tell me what's going on like I just can't figure this out and you know having somebody to go to to just do that is makes a world of difference yeah nice of as you can just send him a video of your shooting and, and oh yeah, yeah. You know what views you need to have in order to get the, you know, see what you want to do, and you know, from different angles, you know, your little selfie sticks, you can hold the camera up, and different angles while somebody's recording you, and you know, that all works really, really nice. And then, um, you know, like like Mark and I was talking, it's like, uh, uh, it, it doesn't beat being there personally, you know, for beginners. Um, somebody like you has been shooting for a while, you know, I can say okay. You're raising your shoulders. You know what to do to correct it. A new person yeah. is like, uh, I ra- did you raise my shoulders? Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. No, no. Lower your shoulders. Okay. No, they're not drop them all the way down. And, you know, that's where yeah, it's nice it's... to be able to just put them in the position. It's like, oh, uh, okay. You know, where somebody's a little more experienced, you can just say, hey, um, quit pulling the trigger. You're doing this. Or... Mm-hmm. And like, one of the big things for me is like, like right now, like the age I'm at, like I'm still like learning how to like mentally take tournaments, you know, being being in those high pressure situations and like, you know, knowing what to do, knowing to trust yourself and, you know, making it happen is that's just very hard. And that just that takes a lot of like just doing it and failing more than anything. And right. but I've got to shoot with Braden Guillantine. Well, I mean, he's one of the Braden's one of the best ever to shoot and you know it's nice like i know him now and we shoot together some and it's like i'm struggling with something Braden doesn't care to help me and i like going to him on like the uh 
on the mental side of things because, you know, Braden has been on the scene since he was 16. So like he knows what it's like to be at my age and, you know, shooting on that stuff. So it's like having the help on the mental side of tournaments and having the help of, you know, Eric helping me shooting the boat. You know what I'm saying? It's very nice. Yeah, there, there's a lot of mental aspect to uh, archery and, um, you know, not just the technique, the process of going through it and, and everything else. And, um, you know, Mark had mentioned in there, which, you know, it's it's more of a martial art than it is a sport. You know, mm-hmm. in, in the aspects, the way everything works. And, you know, we went in a little bit of detail in that in, in, in that podcast. So just go listen to the previous one. It it's it's got a lot of information on there, but yeah, it's it's a whole whole new uh, way of thinking, you know, especially now with you got your compounds and you know with, with traditional bows, you know, it's a lot of instinctive shooting, and then they got all these other methods, you know, the string walking and using the arrows as reference. And uh, for for me, I pick up a recurve bow and I don't look at sights, I don't look at arrows, I just look at the target and and go you know, complete instinct. Mm-hmm. And, and I've tried to shoot a compound that way. I can't do it. I, I just, you know, it, it just doesn't feel right to do it that way. And I have no desire to try and learn because I pick up the compound. Yeah. I go back through all the form and, you know, all the anchor points and, and everything. I get the pin. And so I can't shoot a compound fast. You know, yeah. so I use the recurve for bow fishing because I can draw back and and I'm not worrying about all those things. I come back, yeah, you know, and follow through. And <laughs> I've like shooting like in those high pressure situations. It's a lot of, you know, well, you know, if I you always have those thoughts in your mind. If I make a bad shot right here, this is over. Or you know, well, you know, what if he misses the X on this one? Like you know, or if they do miss it, you know, there's so much extra pressure. Like, yeah, this is hit this one and you put him away you know what i'm saying and you know having that one thought slip it's just probably not going to hit it yeah and that's that's where when you, as soon as you put in your mind it says okay if i miss this one you just told your mind you're going to miss yeah you, you, you know have it's to, like uh, you, don't worry don't put in the if i miss this thing you just focus on okay i'm going to put this right in the center of the x you know, and yep, actually yep. you got that little X in there. I'm going to put it right in the center. I'm going to center right in there. That's what you're focusing on. You're not focusing about whether you miss or not, because you put that in your mind and then you're going to miss. I've seen it's it time and time. Happens so much. And you have to have like, in those situations, you have to have so much confidence in yourself, like in your shot that like, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go out right here and, you know, I'm going to shoot good and, you know, do this no matter how many people are watching or, you know, whatever the situation is, you have to, you know, you have to trust your shot to do, do what you need to do. Yeah. And, and that's just a matter of, you know, going through and, and just practice, practice, practice. And, you know, and, and thinking about, you know, one ways that you could do it. It's like, you got your target and you're constantly shooting, shooting, shooting. Well, Try drawing the back, getting your anchor point, getting everything all ready, eyes closed, then you open your eyes. If you're on target, you know you're doing it the same. And then go ahead and yeah. shoot. And then draw back, eyes closed, get on target, you're on your target. If you're not on target, something's wrong in your position. Never... You need to move move your foot or something. You're, you're off a little bit. You need to do something different. You should be able to draw back and be on that target every time. Uh, we used to do that in uh, you know, on the rifle team all the time. We'd we would get on target, we'd close our eyes, breathe out, you know, breathe in, breathe out, open our eyes. If we're on target, we'd breathe in, breathe out, and squeeze trigger. If we're not, we could twist our, our body. You know, maybe it's a matter of moving your foot uh, an inch or your knee an inch or, or, or twisting something and going in a different position. And then that way, your body is doing the same thing every time. And you're not stressing your muscles because if you're if you're pulling on something, where are you going to end up? You know, as soon as you shoot, you're off. Not in the middle. I mean, yeah. So if you can't be completely relaxed and draw back your eyes closed and be on target, now I would shoot with your eyes closed unless you're 
it's close enough you're not going to miss the target. You know, if you're at 20 yards, you know, especially outdoors, you don't do it because something could walk in front of you. You know, like yeah, I surprise out out shooting and the cat comes running down down the street, you know, and, and hops up on top of the target. And <laughs> Anything can happen, you know. Yeah. And so I, I kind of created a funny uh uh TikTok video as like, yo. Yeah cats on the target and then i had it you know where it kind of sang the voice in there and it's like the cats on the target the cats on the target <laughs> <laughs> you know i had to wait for him to decide to come down you know it's like <laughs> uh my uh we have a we have a house cat and um we have a hallway like on the other side of this wall it's like 10 yards that i shoot in like we have a target at the end of it and especially during indoor season like most nights um most of every night i'm in there shooting especially like you know if I go to a ball game with friends or something and, you know, I don't go to the 20 yard range, I'll just come home and shoot here at night. And like every time Matt, my, it's my sister's cat, but you know, it's the house cat. And, you know, it always will you know run up and down the hallway when I'm shooting and won't just go sit somewhere like it normally does. <laughs> so you got to wait because you never know what that cat's going to, it might just hop up on your target as you shoot. And... Yeah. The, the most she'll ever do is just like claw at the target because like it's one of the big uh four by four big boy targets oh yeah so i mean she likes she likes to claw it that's about it <laughs> yeah it's uh, there's just so many things that can can go wrong and go right you know it just all depends on your attitude and uh you know i've talked to people that have you know amazing attitudes towards shooting and, and their, their mental attitude is just you know, just top notch and you know they're they're young and and you know they're gonna go places and yeah it's just a big uh inspiration to a lot of uh, uh archers you know when you can see somebody that's struggling and then come through and and come back you know yeah and and it's it, it's just it's just so much fun you know like you know doing this um, I've been doing this over a year now, and I think this would be number 82 podcast. Uh, so wow. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. That's a lot. I, I started doing out, you know, just just me providing the information, and then I started doing interviews. And then once I started in interviews, then I had so many people I had to go from once a week to twice a week. So now the podcast will come out on um Mondays and Fridays. And then I upload the video part of it because, you know, we can watch what's going on. And sometimes there's an advantage to, you know, especially I'm talking to a vendor, you know, we can show their products and I'll mm -hmm. actually share screens yeah. of their website. And, and that comes out on my YouTube channel on Tuesdays and Saturdays. And I used to upload it to the Archery Group, you know, on Sundays before it come out. But I just say, yeah. okay, I'm going to provide extra for them because now they can communicate with us, which every yeah. once in a while I look over. I'm looking over the screen, see if anybody made any comments, um, you know, so they can, they can watch this live. So they might get two a week, three a week. Some of the times I've done four in one week. Um, yeah. Know, so, I mean, that's nice, especially like, like you know, say ye yesterday with the, you had a college coach on there, you know, having, yeah, you know, they could ask whatever they wanted to about it, you yeah. know, and a, and a lot of people like on the college level of things don't know a lot, but like my sister shoots at the Cumberlands and she's had a successful four years down there. So I, I've got to learn a lot about the college of archery and you know how that stuff works, but there's, I feel like at my age, there's not a lot of people that know about it enough. Yeah. Cause you can actually get scholarships, you know, for yeah. archery and mm -hmm. you know, that would be amazing to get, be able to get a, get a scholarship just to go shoot your bow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping to go down to the Cumberlands and shoot for them. Yeah, that would that would really be nice. You know, your sister's got all the information there. And, you know, maybe we can get her on one of these days to talk about her her, her uh experiences in at the college level. And yeah. You should. She's a she's a really big shooter. I mean, she's she'll be shooting the World Cups this year and stuff for Team USA and everything. Yeah, that that's really good. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have any parting thoughts? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, 
Not really. You have any more questions? <laughs> no, I just, you know, um, I suppose, what would you say to a new archer just starting out? Stay at it. It takes a lot of time and a lot of struggling before before it gets good. And one, once it, I mean, even, I mean, everybody has struggles at, you know, different times in shooting careers. You see pros do it all the time. And, you know, in the beginning, it's important to stay at it, stay shooting a lot, and just keep an open mind on it. But I would yeah, say. That's, it's, it's amazing, you know, when you get a new archer and, and, they they see how much fun it is and and just just take off with it uh, yeah it, it's it's a sport and you know if you have troubles with something you ask you know, yes ask. like i say all the There's... all the time the only dumb question is the one you haven't asked <laughs> yep i ask stuff all the time about you know different things in archery and just trying to keep keep learning you know anything and everything i can with it Yeah, well, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show. Uh, yeah, uh, I know you're thank, going places. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yes, I've enjoyed this today. It's been a lot of fun talking about hunting and archery and everything. Yeah, that that's that's the best part of this. I get to talk to other archers about hunting and archery. You know, yeah, what, I mean, what better game than to, 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 yeah, to exactly. talk about <laughs> archery? You know, and then promote the sport of archery. You know, because there's yeah, there's a lot of people out here and. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll get into some of the manufacturers that have a new new thing that's really cool. And I get to present mm -hmm. it to, you know, other archers that are hunting and stuff like that. So, yeah, that, that's the that's the fun part. And, and, you know, talking to people all over the world, you know, yeah. if, if you can I'm just, I'm, speak English or get a translator, we're, we're going to yeah, get on there. <laughs> and just hearing uh, hunting stories from other people is cool to me, like. I enjoy listening to hunting story stories from other people, you know, no matter what, what it is. Yeah. And, and you know, if we've hunted, we have a story, you know, yeah, if you've hunted exactly. once, you have a story, you know, yes. if you're preparing for your first hunt, you have a story. <laughs> you always got a story about it. Yeah. Always got a story. You know, it, when I started out, if I seen a footprint in the dirt, it was a good day. <laughs> I was going to see a footprint yeah. in the dirt. You know, okay, that's a good day. At least there's deer in the area. You know, yeah, at least you know they're there, right? There wasn't a lot of deer. You know, we, in Nebraska, we had two tags. That was it. That's all you could get. Mm -hmm. uh, and then now they've got so much that, you know, they have season choice ones. You know, you, know, you can get multiple deer. You can get a bunch of those. And, you know, you know, then it's got from, okay, now I've seen a deer. It might be yeah. running through a field as I'm driving in or out, uh, but I've seen a deer. Now it's a good day because mm -hmm. I used to see a live deer. You know, and then you get where yeah. it's, you, you learn how to hunt them and learn where they're at. And then, then you, you expect this, you know, you get where you, you're seeing them just about every day, you may not get a shot. And then, uh, you know, you, you expect kind of to see there. a couple, you know? Yeah. If you see at least one, you know, you can't really, you can't call it a bad day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, when you get a hunting area that they're coming through at night, that's kind of hard yeah. to hunt with a bow. Yeah. That, yeah, it can get hard. Just got to find property where they go through it during the day or they hang out during the day, at least. They're somewhere during the daytime. <laughs> yeah, they're somewhere during the day. Well, my name is Roy Canterbury, your host today on Arch Talk 101. And stay tuned for our, our next uh, show. And we'll we'll see you later.